Hmm. <laughs> I grew up actually in a very conservative Christian home. Uh, I grew up Southern Baptist. And uh, yeah, it was exciting. Um, I was, growing up, I was kind of super Christian. You know, anybody know like a super Christian? My nickname in high school was God Boy. <laughs> I was the kid with the Bible in his backpack and a bunch of tracks from church ready to witness to anybody who would listen and a bunch of people who wouldn't. Um, I was always ready to preach at anyone about any controversial issue that I thought Christians should take a stand on and I knew why they were wrong. Maybe some of you knew someone like that in high school. If so, I apologize. Mm. Maybe some of you were that person in high school. Mm. In which case, hey. Um, <laughs> I wore Christian t-shirts. I listened to Christian rock music. I played Christian video games. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I grew up when the um, original Nintendo was popular, and one of the most popular games at the time was The Legend of Zelda. So of course, yeah. So of course we had to have a Christian version of it. So there was a Christian version of The Legend of Zelda called Spiritual Warfare. <laughs> This was not authorized by Nintendo, shockingly. Mm -hmm. But it was basically a complete ripoff of The Legend of Zelda. Um, there were a few differences. Um, in The Legend of Zelda, you're trying to save a princess. In Spiritual Warfare, you're questing against the powers of darkness. Um, in, uh, in, in The Legend of Zelda, you um, collect weapons on your quest. In Spiritual Warfare, you collect the fruits of the spirit. <laughs> Only they're actual fruits. <laughs> Apples and pomegranates and bananas. <laughs> I'm not kidding, this is real. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't believe this. I'm going to look this up on Wikipedia later. It's true. And in, in The Legend of Zelda, your enemies are monsters. In Spiritual Warfare, your enemies are the unsaved. Right? <laughs> so when you encounter the unsaved, you throw the fruit of the spirit at them. <laughs> or blow them up with vials of God's wrath. <laughs> at which point they repent, convert, and disappear. <laughs> so that was sort of the world I grew up in. And that was the way I approached con conflict and controversy in the world as a Christian. I felt like it was my job to throw my faith at people so that they would convert to what is true. On the subject of homosexuality, I knew that I knew everything there was to know on the topic. I knew that being gay was a choice, I knew that being gay was a sin, and I knew that it was my job to stand up and speak out against it because I wanted to save people from a destructive lifestyle that wasn't God's plan for them. And that probably would have been where this ended and I wouldn't be standing here today were it not for one little thing, which is that God Boy had a secret. It was what I thought was the worst secret in the world, and that was that when I hit puberty and all my guy friends started to notice girls for the first time, you know, really notice them. They used to have cooties and all of a sudden they had boobs. And I, <laughs> I'm always afraid of making that joke on a Christian campus, but it seems to be like the favorite joke of all the Christian campuses <laughs> that I speak at. Um, <laughs> I'm always afraid I'll get a stern talking to later. Um, but it's true, right? So they started to notice girls for the first time and I was having the opposite experience. I was starting to notice guys. And I didn't know why. I mean, at first I thought it was a phase that I would grow out of. I thought this is just, a, it's a thing that's happening. I'm gonna grow out of it. Um, and I tried not to think about it and stay focused on my faith and focused on my schoolwork and focused on my family. And I listened to focus on the family and basically <laughs> tried to continue being a good, you know, God boy. Um, and it wasn't just external things. My faith has always been not just real, but like 
the most intimate like thing at my core, you know what I'm saying? Like my faith has always been the most important thing in my life. I accepted Christ at a young age. I reconfirmed my life to Christ as a teenager. And so I didn't understand how somebody like me, who was a good Christian who loved God, could be attracted to the same sex. But I kept thinking I would grow out of it, and when I didn't grow out of it, I kept praying about it. And when God wasn't changing me, I got to the point that I was crying myself to sleep night after night, begging God, please don't let me feel this way anymore. And finally, I had to admit to my girlfriend, oh yes, I had a girlfriend, she and I went to a concert, it was a Christian concert, of course. Jars of Clay and Michael W. Smith. <laughs> and there was this moment where this guy like walked by. And he was going back to, to join his group, wherever they were, I don't know, maybe he'd been to the restroom or getting popcorn or I don't know. And I just, for this moment, like I saw him and there was this thing, there was this moment where I was like, who's that guy? Like, I can't explain why I felt that way. It wasn't, it wasn't lust, but it was attraction. It was like, oh, wow, that guy is attractive, and I wonder what he's like, and I would love to just, like, meet him and talk to him and find out what his interests are, and, like, I wonder if he would want to hang out sometime. I mean, I don't know him, but, like, you know, there was like, the urge to, like, get up and be like, hey, you want to hang out sometime? You know, it's weird. Like, and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Why am I feeling this? And so I look at my girlfriend who's holding my hand, and she's, like, totally in love with me. And I look at this guy who's, you know, now gone, and I'm thinking, I don't know the first thing about this guy, but for some reason I feel this connection where I want to get to know him better, and it's something I've never felt for this girl who's sitting next to me. And it clicked for me for the first time, like, oh, this is what people talk about. When they talk about seeing someone, you know, when they talk about having a crush on someone, being attracted to someone, that feeling, that romantic feeling, that sexual feeling, that like all of it together, that sense of being attracted to another person, this is what my guy friend feels for my girlfriend. This is what all the guys that I know feel for the girls that they talk about. This is why they talk about them the way they do. This is why they objectify them sometimes, which I always frowned upon and said, you know, I'm a Christian, so I don't lust. But I started realizing, wait, it's more than just that I'm a good Christian boy and I don't lust after women. I don't feel what it is they feel. And I didn't know what to do about that because I thought something's messed up with me and I don't know why. Am I not a good enough Christian? I mean, I'm, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm forgiven and I, I, I love God and God's at the center of my life. And, and I started crying uh, in the middle of a Michael W. Smith concert, holding my girlfriend's hand. But Michael W. Smith was singing Friends and everyone cries during Friends, so... <laughs> So I, I thought, you know, there's something is wrong with me and I need to figure out what it is. And it was when I was 18 that I, for the first time, had this revelation that I was like, oh my gosh, this is what people mean when they say they're gay. When somebody uses the word gay, I always thought gay meant like you are like, marching half naked in a pride parade or you're having promiscuous sex with all these you know people if for some reason these guys are like you know women weren't enough for them and so now they're having sex with men or something you know but I just, all of a sudden i realized no 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 it's that's not it what they mean is that they're attracted to the same sex the way the way that i am that there are some people who feel like this and it was this weird moment where it was simultaneously this huge relief and this horrible, terrifying thing. Like, the relief was like, uh, the way I always describe it is, if you have ever had weird medical symptoms and you don't know what's wrong and you go to one doctor after another doctor after another doctor, and every doctor's like, I don't know. I don't know why you're experiencing this. I don't know what's wrong. Let's do some more tests. Let me send you to another specialist. And finally, you find the doctor who says, I know what's wrong. I have a name for this. There's a diagnosis for this. And they give you a name. Even if it's a horrible diagnosis, even if it's fatal, there's some sense of relief in being able to say, I'm not crazy. Other people have experienced this. This is a known thing that exists in the world that has been named. 
And that was this sense of relief that I had like, oh, until that moment, I literally thought I was the only guy in the entire world who had ever experienced these feelings. And this is why this was the secret I was going to take to my grave. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, other guys have, and there's a word for it, and the word is gay. And that means I'm connected to all these other people who know what it feels like to be where I am right now. And then there was this terrifying bit that's like, what does that mean? So I realized I was gay, but then I was like, well, okay, if I have a diagnosis, now I need a cure. So I got connected with what are popularly known as ex-gay ministries, where I thought that they would help me become straight, but I quickly learned that they could help people stop having promiscuous gay sex, but those people never actually became straight. I talked to people who were the success stories of the movement, and they said, no, look, your attractions don't actually change. You can stop your behavior, but... I'm like, well, I don't have any behavior to stop. I'm God boy, what are you talking about? <laughs> I found that the church didn't really know how to take this because everyone I knew assumed that gay people chose to be gay and could choose not to be. There's an episode of South Park where Stan finds out that his dog Sparky is gay. <laughs> and so he trains him and he sits him down and he's like, sit Sparky, good boy. Now shake, good boy. Now. Don't be gay. <laughs> Don't be gay, Spark. Don't be gay. And Sparky just kind of looks at him like, Arr? and of course Cartman's like, hey, he's standing pretty gay to me. But <laughs> that was the reaction of my Christian friends to me. Just don't be gay. Just don't be gay. And I was like, I don't know how to just not be gay if gay means attracted to the same sex. What I realized was that so many of my Christian friends had been living the way that I had, treating the idea of homosexuality as a, a, a political issue to be debated. You know, I was always so concerned that I felt like I had heard that there were churches that were gay affirming, and, and I felt like, well, that's not consistent with, you know, what I understand the, the Bible to say on the subject. And I saw this, the culture that was shifting, and like I said, I was worried that people would think that they were gay when they weren't, and they would go down this self-destructive self lifestyle and all this stuff. And so... I had always been so concerned with that that I, I had always treated this issue as something to be debated and argued and, you know, tell people I'm right. And then I'd never seen anything wrong with that until all of a sudden I was on the other side of it saying, I don't really want to debate this. I am just lonely and terrified and I don't know what the rest of my life looks like. And all my Christian friends who were in that same zone I had been in responded by wanting to debate with me. Well, haven't you read what the scriptures say? Don't you know that Leviticus says a man should not lie with a man as with a woman? And I would say, but I'm not lying with anybody. I I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to do with the rest of my life because I think I might be this way for the rest of my life. And uh, does that mean I, I need to, 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 to be celibate for the rest of my life? If so, I mean, if that's what God calls me to, I'll do it. But that's scary. And I want to know people are going to walk that road with me. Or have I misunderstood what the Bible has to say on this? Because I thought I knew that the Bible said that People chose to be gay, and now I'm realizing I'm gay and I didn't choose to be. So, I mean, maybe I need to rethink this. I, I don't know. I don't want to come to the wrong conclusion. I don't want to defy God. I, I want to live my life in a holy way. I really need the church's support. And mostly what I felt from the church was a complete lack of support. People who started treating me as an issue instead of as a person. This person they'd known, you know, all their lives. Just because they said, I think I'm gay, it was like this word all of a sudden meant that I had like abandoned my faith and abandoned the scriptures. And it was devastating. I felt like I was a leper um, and I didn't know what to do. So we argue back and forth about how to understand these passages and how to understand what the Bible is saying to us. But ultimately, the more I studied the Bible and Jesus's way of approaching scripture and approaching the law, the more I came to the conclusion that I believed God would bless same-sex marriages, and, and that's uh, what I stand for today. But I have many friends, many Christian friends, including some gay Christian friends who don't agree with me on that. And so the question for me is, on the one hand, what do I think the right answer is? Well, that's what I think the right answer is. Some of you probably are like, yes, I totally agree with you, and some of you are like, no. It matters. I think it matters to all of us. I don't think it's a non-issue. I don't think it's something we just go, well, you know, we'll just agree to disagree. It matters, right? Because if we say something's not sin that is, that's bad. 
If we say something is sin that isn't and make people feel unwelcome and they leave the church, that's also bad. There's not a safe answer. So we all agree that it matters that we get this right, but we don't agree on what the right answer is. And I would love to just say, so now all of you have to agree with me, and that's the end of the conversation. (laughs) And some of you would be happy with that, but I know some of you don't agree with me. So as a church, as we wrestle with this, the question is, how do we go forward? Where do we go from here?